you, as soon as you say end time, they say, whoa, the end of the world. When's it going to be? And you can see this mask of fear. I'm not telling you the end time is coming. I'm telling you, you live in it right now. Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 4. The first beast was like a lion. We have the evil used continually to depict the United States of America. You see it on government. We are the, the generation for which these people... that you will not miss one segment of understanding end time because I've had many people tell me it's changed their life forever. Many of the major prophecies of the Bible are given to us two, three, some of them as high as four or five times. There's not any chance it's not going to happen because it's in your Bible, it's prophesied, and the prophecies always come to God. One of the greatest prophetic fulfillments of all time was the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. However, that event on May 14, 1948 was only one small part of a 4,000 year story. On today's edition of End of the Age, we'll tell you the rest of the story. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about prophetic fulfillment, there have been so many, but there's none greater than the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. We're talking about a people with no country for almost 2,000 years, yet they were miraculously reborn as a nation in 1948. I want to take you to the prophecy so you're not just taking my word for it. You're going to know that this was foretold by God himself in the Bible. Well, it was 2,500 years ago now. We find the prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 23 through 29. Listen to it carefully. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. This is the reason that Israel went into captivity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel 
and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me. When they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord. What an incredible prophecy. This prophecy tells us Israel was driven into exile because of her iniquity. Of course, the ultimate iniquity was rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. I mean, Jesus was their creator. He was their God. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own received him not. So here he is walking the streets of Jerusalem, the seashores of the Sea of Galilee, teaching, preaching, doing miracles. But most of Israel rejected him and the leaders of Israel ended up crucifying him. So when they rejected the very Messiah they claimed to long for, that was the greatest act of unbelief that Israel had ever committed. The result was that they were driven out for, from their land. Now I wanna go back. In order for us all to really appreciate this, let's go back 4,000 years ago. There was a man born by the name of Abraham. To really get the impact of this, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Genesis means beginnings. The first 11 chapters covers 2,000 years of human history. Then we get to chapter number 12, and it's as though God slams on the brakes and spins 12 chapters on the life of one man. Now, I mean, all the people who had ever lived from Adam until Abraham, he gave them a total of 11 chapters. But then when Abraham comes along, he spends 12 chapters on the life of this one man. Why? Because Abraham was destined to be the father of the physical people of God upon the earth, the Jews, and the spiritual people of God upon the earth, the church. Then let's fast forward 600 years until we get to 1400 BC. That's when Joshua led the children of Israel into their promised land. Now God had promised Abraham, the land on which you dwell will be yours and your descendants after you forever. And he defined the borders of the promised land in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. He said from the river of Egypt in the south to the Euphrates River in the north, from the Mediterranean Sea over into the land of Jordan. Those were to be the boundaries of the promised land. So they entered that promised land in 1400 B.C. Now, the modern history of Israel we're experiencing right now, we're going to get to that. But you can't really appreciate it unless you understand where we've come from and the events that have led up to this present time. After the children of Israel entered the promised land led by Joshua in 1400 BC, King David moved the capital from Hebron, which is about 30 miles south of Jerusalem, up to the city of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem became the eternal capital of the people of Israel. It's been their capital ever since, except for the period of time when they were driven away into exile. So Israel's capital 
it was made its capital, Jerusalem was made its capital in 1000 BC. Then Judah was carried away into Babylonian captivity in 606 BC, but returned to Jerusalem 70 years later in 536 BC. Again, the people of Israel stayed there until 70 AD, even though they lived under foreign occupation, the Romans from about 197 BC until uh, 70 AD, they occupied this territory. Jesus, his disciples lived under Roman occupation. Finally, the Romans drove the Jews out of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the Jewish people began to be scattered around the world. From 70 AD until 1948 AD, 1,878 years, the Jewish people were filtered through the nations, through Russia, through Poland, through Germany, through France, through England, and around the world. The Jewish people were filtered among the nations. Now think a bit about that. 1,878 years, there was no country called Israel. There was no Jewish country. Yet, miraculously, they maintained their identity because they remembered one thing God commanded them, do not intermarry with the heathen. Well, they maintained that practice for the most part. And that way the Jewish people retained their individual identity. Well, that was up until 1948. Now, shortly before 1948, other things begin to happen. God begins to uh, put an urgency in the hearts of the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem. Well, they did return to Jerusalem in 1948. That's when they were declared a nation on May the 14th of 1948. Then in 1967, the city of Jerusalem was Reunited, They had controlled West Jerusalem from 1948 to 1967. But when Jordan attacked them in 1967, they counterattacked, reunified Jerusalem, drove Jordan back across the Jordan River from which she had come in 1948. And Israel now has maintained control of Jerusalem from that day until this. Then finally, in 1980, Israel declared the unification of Jerusalem and officially annexed East Jerusalem so that Jerusalem was once again to become its eternal undivided capital. In addition to that, just this year, something you and I have personally experienced, President Trump announced that the United States was recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and would move our embassy there, which happened on May the 14th of 2018. So here we are, we're living through this long story and we're not to the end of the story yet because the Bible tells us that in the not too distant future, and I'm talking about the really near future, that Israel is going to build her third temple. The first temple was built in 968 BC. The second temple was built in 516 BC. The third temple is getting ready to, to be built just ahead of us now. The Bible explicitly prophesies that the Temple Mount is going to be placed under a sharing arrangement between Muslims and Jews, and the Jewish people on their portion will build their temple without disturbing the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, this is going to be an amazing prophetic fulfillment. You and I are going to see it. When? I can't tell you for certain. It could be 2019. Perhaps it will be 2020, maybe even 2021, but we're very close to it right now. President Trump has already announced that he has a peace plan. He calls it the deal of the century. He wants to put it together. However, the enemies of Israel have totally different ideas. An article appeared just recently. This article appeared in Israel National News and an Iranian official warned Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, that he better start practicing swimming in the Mediterranean Sea. This was carried in the Israel National News October the 5th 
of 2018. The deputy commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guards warned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Friday to practice swimming in the Mediterranean because he would be forced to abandon his country. I tell the prime minister of the Zionist regime to practice swimming in the Mediterranean because soon he will have no choice but to flee into the sea, said Brigadier General Hossein Salami. And he was quoted by the uh, AFP. Now, the Palestinians also are filing complaints because President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. They filed a complaint in the world court. Here's the story. The Palestinian suit requests the court to order the United States of America to withdraw its diplomatic mission from the holy city of Jerusalem. This is in the Jerusalem Post, just September the 29th of 2018. The International Court of Justice on Friday said it has received a complaint from the state of Palestine against the United States, arguing that the U.S. government's placement of its Israeli embassy in Jerusalem violates an international treaty and it should be moved. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, known as the World Court, said in a statement, Palestine argues the 1961 Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations requires a country to locate its embassy on the territory of a host state. While Israel controls Jerusalem militarily, its ownership is disputed. Listen to that. They're still disputing Israel's right to Jerusalem, even though they've controlled it since 1967. And it was illegally controlled. The half of it was illegally controlled by Jordan from 1948 to 1967. They came over the Jordan River to try to destroy the nation of Israel. They were not successful. But when the ceasefire was declared in 1949, they stayed right where they were continuing to occupy half of East Jerusalem. Well, the International Criminal Justice Court is the United Nations venue for resolving disputes between nations. Palestine was recognized by the UN General Assembly in 2012 as a non-member observer state, though its statehood is not recognized by either Israel or the United States of America. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's so important for us to really grasp what we're watching here. I'm not talking about just a political development or some event in world history. I am talking about one of the very greatest prophetic fulfillments in the history of mankind. Now, think with me because I want you to be in awe of what God has done. We're talking about a prophecy that began 4,000 years ago that the land that we call Israel today would be the promised land for the Jewish people. God said to Abraham, you and your descendants after you will dwell in this land forever. God actually said, Abraham, I enter into covenant with you this day that the land on which you dwell will be yours and your descendants after you forever. If you'd like to read it for yourself, Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. So this big dispute over who owns the Holy Land and who owns Jerusalem is really a dispute between God and Satan. God is the one that made this decision. It wasn't Abraham that made this decision. It was God that made this decision. So when we see the nations of the world disputing and making war over the status of Jerusalem and over the territory called the promised land. We are really watching a spiritual clash and that's not where it's going to end. Even after a peace agreement, which will be signed soon, it may be the agreement that President Trump has been working on since the day 
he became president. They now have the plan ready. They just haven't presented it yet because Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinians, says, I want nothing to do with it. Now, President Trump, though, has made up in his mind he's going to get the deal of the century done. He made this pronouncement before he ever became president. While he was campaigning to become president, he said, my number one goal will be to do the deal that can't be done. Everybody's tried to get a peace deal between Palestinians and Israelis, but they failed. I'd like to give it a try. I don't know whether I can do it or not, but remember, President Trump wrote the book, The Art of the Deal, and he's made some pretty incredible deals so far. Perhaps he'll be able to do it again, but whether he does it or someone else, your Bible prophesies there's soon to be a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, please hear me carefully. When they sign this agreement, you'll be able to mark your calendar and know that you are seven years away from the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. And you also are seven years away from the historic prophetic battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, that's where we're living right now. Everybody wants to know how close, how quick till the deal is signed. It could be yet this year, uh, more likely next year. But then perhaps they won't get it done next year. Perhaps it'll be 2020, 2021. All I can tell you is, all of the pieces of the puzzle are coming together right now. And all the other prophecies we have that are supposed to occur during the end time, right before the second coming of Jesus to this earth, all of those prophecies are converging right now. So as you and I see this, what should we be doing? I mean, let's just say the final seven years would begin in 2019. And by the way, totally within the realm of possibility. So let's say that that did in fact start next year. What will you do about it? What will I do about it? How will that impact us? If we know that we are seven short years away from the visible, physical return of Jesus down to this earth, clearly prophesied in our Bibles. If we know we're seven years away, what should we do? Now the Bible prophesies that some people will know it and will do the right thing. The Bible prophesies that during this final seven year period, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They that know their God will be strong and do exploits. So, the, there are going to be people that understand that we just entered the final seven years and they are going to be obsessed and seized with a desire to evangelize the world, to tell the whole world. Now, many people paint the final seven years as a time of chaos and disaster, and it will be a difficult time. On the earth will be a political leader called the Antichrist and also a religious leader called the false prophet in the Bible. These two personages will work together to set up a one world government and a one world religion and to bring about religious and political conformity to this world. They will enforce it with economic sanctions. Anyone that does not go along with their plan for this new world order, and they may well call it the new world order. Anyone that does not go along with this plan will be placed under economic sanctions. The Bible paints a picture of a cashless society. We're very close to a cashless society right now. 80% of all consumer purchases last year 80% in the United States of America were done electronically. And you probably pay your house payment, your car payments, other payments electronically. We are in a very advanced cashless society. The Bible tells us that under this coming new world order, 
Everyone will be given a number. They will be used for buying and selling. We're already doing it now to a great extent. The only caveat will be when you get your number in order to validate it, you're going to have to pledge allegiance to the one world government and the one world religion. This will be done under the guise of bringing peace and harmony to the world and preventing war from ever happening again. But the truth will be, it will be designed to make each of us pledge allegiance and to worship the Antichrist. The Bible says, whosoever will not worship the beast, another name for the Antichrist, he will be sanctioned economically and possibly be killed. It's called the mark of the beast. I'm sure you've heard about it. You say, I don't believe in that. Well, shouldn't you? The prophecy is 2,000 years old, but it's never been possible to be fulfilled until the invention of the internet, until the invention of the computer. We only now have the technology together to fulfill a prophecy that was given to us 2,000 years ago. So what am I saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, today? I am telling you, the end time has arrived. You and I are in it right now. This marvelous prophecy about the rebirth of the nation of Israel, we've watched it come to pass, 1948, 1967, and then this year, 2018, we saw Jerusalem once again recognized as the eternal undivided capital of the nation of Israel.